Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome to another episode of the Reliability Matters podcast. I am so glad you are with me today. Thanks for being part of our podcast family. And speaking of today, it seems today the entire world is experiencing supply chain shortages and challenges in nearly all product categories. In the electronic assembly industry, the focus has been within the semiconductor market, especially in North America. We know that as the great chip shortage. Why is this? How did the U.S. and the rest of North America allow this to occur? What Was it short-sightedness? Was it greed or an over-reliance on foreign suppliers or other factors or a combination of all of these factors? And what would it take to finally address this issue? And are we doing anything about it? My guest today is Matt Kelly, Chief Technologist at IPC, one of our leading industry trade organizations. IPC recently published a report on the chip shortage and perhaps most importantly, came up with a list of 28 recommendations our industry can consider to remedy this issue. As I stated, Matt Kelly is chief technologist at IPC and is focused on driving the next generation technology advancements and supply chain transformation across the electronics industry. He works within the association's executive leadership team to identify and develop new strategic initiatives meeting member and industry needs. He delivers influential thought leadership, research, and advocacy to industry and governments. He leads IPC's Chief Technology Council to continually drive the electronics industry forward. His focus areas include Industry 4.0, Factory of the Future Digitization, Modernization, Adoption, and Implementation, IPC expansion into new advanced packaging technologies, including IC substrates and OSAT manufacturing, and next-generation electronic systems design methods. When I first met Matt, he was with IBM, and Matt comes to IPC following a 15-year career at IBM, holding several senior technology and engineering leadership positions with an IBM systems division. His technical contributions include 25 patents, 85 publications, and numerous industry awards. Matt is a licensed professional engineer with a degree in chemical engineering from McMaster University and holds an MBA in strategic management from Sir Wilfrid Laurier University. So without any further ado, let me bring in Matt to the show. Hey, Matt. Welcome back. Hey, Mike. How are you? I'm well, thanks. I hope you are well as well. Uh, you, I am in Southern California. You are quite far away from me. You are in, uh, should I say, the greater Toronto area? Is that is that? I am. Yes, I'm uh, sitting here in uh, beautiful Toronto, Canada. So thanks for having me on the show. It's, it's always great when we get a chance to catch up. Yes, and you and I saw each other not too long ago, a few months ago in Toronto. Uh, and we were just talking before we started recording. We were so close, but so far, we we I wanted to talk to you about this subject, and and uh, and we just kept circling around. And every time we got close to talking, someone would tap us on the shoulder and distract us, and and we never really got to do it. So I'm glad that you're with me uh, today. I think this is an extremely important topic. Um, you know, this show is about reliability. So how does uh, the future of U.S. manufacturing, the semiconductor shortage, all that kind of stuff? Uh, bring it, you know, fall into reliability. Everything falls into reliability. I can, I can definitely connect dots because right now uh, the chip shortage is leading to uh, an explosion in counterfeit and, and uh, reuse of old components and, and sometimes hastily redesigns to find components that can be used that are not in as short a supply. And whenever hasty decisions are made or counterfeit, uh, you know, comes into the picture, that certainly affects reliability. Um, so, uh, it, what I, one thing that is important to reliability is a uh, sustainable, predictable, reliable supply chain. And when that breaks down, it has all the dominoes fall. You know, and so I think it's a it's a very important subject. But before we get started, real quick, uh, just you know, a, a personal question. You worked at IBM for 15 years. Uh, my father uh, was a programmer in the 60s on IBM IBM mainframes, and he used to. Um, bring me to his office on weekends uh, when he was doing 
you know, like a giant code coding project, you know. And uh, back then in the 60s, you didn't sit at home on your laptop wearing headphones listening to heavy metal. You know, you were in the office on key punch machines, and he used to let me play on the key punch machines. And I thought I was Captain Kirk. You know, I thought I was, you know, I'm in the lap of technology. Um, but I, in the course of going there over several years to his office, uh, I was talking to a few IBM employees when I was, I was probably a teenager by that point. And, you know, IBM, of course, the acronym is International Business Machines, but they all had a different acronym for it. They said it was, it stands for I've been moved because back in the day, um, if you wanted to move up in the company, you had to show your willingness to be a, you know, company man or a company woman. Um, and you had to show your loyalty by agreeing to move and they'd kind of test you and move you around the country. What, was that your experience? Did that, did that, um, that particular, um, business style end by the time you started or was there a little bit of truth to that, uh, when you were there? I uh, know. I mean, the models changed significantly. I think COVID has kind of fueled that as well. So there, there's a little bit of that. I think it depends on the, the type of function uh, that um, and the experience that you're trying to gain. So I don't know if it's necessarily moving for moving sake, but uh, with big companies like IBM, I mean, there's, there's lots to see and learn and understand, especially getting out of your comfort zone. So I think that would, that was the reason, but um, no, I, you know, a lot of collaboration um, it, it's how the supply chain runs, um, you know, Monday to Friday. And, and when you, when you can, or you have to go to a facility you know, quite frankly, it costs a lot of money these days to be flying places and sure. not just in terms of money, but in terms of the time. So, um, yeah, no, uh, the, um, the, the internet has, has allowed people to, to stay a little bit, uh, you know, where they live and, and, sure. and that sort of thing. Yeah. I'm sure there's other ways to prove your loyalty as a company person. Uh, they did hand out these. I don't know if, if, if these were a thing when, uh, you were there. Um, uh, but this was something my dad got in the, I think in the late sixties or very early seventies and, this is what they gave out to customers. You know, you buy a $100,000 computer and they give you a, a sign that says think. But what a great advertising. Um, it doesn't, you know, it says in very tiny writing, compliments of IBM Corporation. But just the mantra of think, how much further ahead would our industry be if we practice that, that little advertising slogan, think. Um, all right, uh, let's get on with the subject at hand, a little bit more important than... IBM's uh, employee promotion program, uh, and that is the uh, call it the chip shortage. I mean, it's a shortage of everything today, but but the poster child is a chip shortage, and that's what really falls on on our lap. Uh, and during our our conversation today, we're going to make a few references um, because these were references um, in an article that you were involved in producing for IPC. Uh, one talks about Moore's Law, one talks about advanced packaging, one talks about OSAT, OSAT. Uh, let's, for the, uh, some of my audience, much of my audience is deep into this industry, some kind of orbit around this industry. Um, so just to clear the uh, playing field, um, let's kind of start with the beginner's mindset. Um, you refer to Moore's Law in, in the article. So uh, explain to me and my audience, what is Moore's Law and how has it changed over the years? Well, Moore's Law is, is named after uh, Gordon Moore, uh, who made an observation that at the rate and pace that they were going uh, back in the, the time, that uh, the number of transistors that you could fit in a given area would double um, at a certain rate. Um, so um, what that does is it increases the speed and the, and the capability of that, uh, that silicon chip to be more powerful, to, to run faster, and all these sorts of functions. So it, it's um, you know been a, a linear uh, progression over many years. The trouble is, is as we're getting into the feature sizes uh, that we're at now, the um, the economics of while we can physically do some things, the cost and the um, the ability to to actually produce such a structure is now becoming cost prohibitive more and more. So um, the idea of Moore's law is that it's it's really just a way to describe, you know, miniaturization of transistors. Um, but it's, it's running out of gas because it's becoming too expensive is the way it is. And so that's, what's really driving this new notion of, of uh, heterogeneous integration and chiplet architectures, which is really what this is all about. Yeah. Well, if you go back to the old, like Intel days, um, in the early days of the PC, you know, the first PC was about 4.7 
megahertz. And then it went to 16, then it went to 32, then 64. And, and every year or so, the speeds would double. And then at some point, the speed started going up by 50%. And then the next chipsets, the speeds were 20% faster. And then the next chipsets, they were maybe 5% faster. Uh, so the, the doubling does have a lifespan, clearly. Moore's Law was a, um, it, it was true and tried and proven until it wasn't. And it's probably still possible, but as you're, you point out, it's not practical. The costs to get to that next level uh, was, um, uh, was prohibitive. In fact, Intel, uh, engineer at Intel told me the reason why the next chips are not doubling in speed is because Intel needed to have the next generation chip twice the speed of the one they were about to release completed so they could use it to test the new chip. And you know the ability to go twice the speed to test a chip at half the speed was prohibitive, cost prohibitive. So the, the rate of advancement started slowing down. I'm gonna, uh, oh, let's also, um, let's define advanced packaging as opposed to less advanced packaging, just for our audience sake. When you, yeah, this when is my favorite question packaging. because yeah, we, we get, we get excited with, you know, we start talking about semiconductors and silicon and advanced packages. And, um, I think the easiest way to, to describe an advanced package is that it is an electronic component. It's a certain category. It's, uh, classified as logic. Um, the different types of functions that these, that this advanced package, uh, world uh, can handle are things like compute, uh, memory, storage, uh, mixed signal, analog, digital type of conversions. There's a variety of things, but it's an active component. It's actually in the circuit. It is, you know, think of it as the brain. Uh, the best example for your, for your listeners would be, you know, Intel inside your laptop. You probably, you know, Intel or AMD or some processor sticker that you can look at. And it's, it's processing the information. Uh, the other main area is memory, and that's actually one of the fastest growing areas. Uh, you've, you've seen a switch to uh, solid state uh, and uh, flash and other the NAND type of uh, memory structures. So um, it's a very important electronic component that is used within literally every electronics product, um, you know, in terms of application. So it's, a, it's, and it's a very wide and a very big space. We can, we can talk a little bit more about sure. that. Sure. And then you also make references to OSAT, O-S-A-T. That is an acronym for? Outsource Semiconductor Assembly and Test. And so the, the best way to think about it, that is, uh, is an EMS company. So an EMS provider uh, builds a final assembly for an OEM. An OSAT provider builds the final component for the component OEM. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, thanks for defining those terms. If we if we stumble across some terms that we have not yet defined, I may stop you and and we'll bring our audience up to speed. I'm gonna um, read a little bit of a, a page here because this is I'm gonna quote you in the article that you were involved with, um, so that we can bring our conversation into perspective. You stated uh, in your article that North America lags behind Asia in capacity, but tech, but technical uh, capability is a source of concern as well. Asian manufacturers also dominate the printed circuit board, PCB, and electronic manufacturing services, EMS, ODM, sectors, where outsourcing is off and offshoring have been prevalent over the past 20 years. Asia's dominance in, electronic, in electronics arises from the region's breadth of manufacturing capabilities from chips through advanced packaging, through PCB fabrication, and final hardware and system assembly capabilities. So my question after, after reading that, my question is, what are some of the factors that led to Asia's dominance and North America's lag in these technologies? In other words, how did we get here? That's a, probably a, a, a small question with a giant answer, but... Uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's a great question. And I often ask myself that uh, as we work through this. Um, essentially, this is a 25 year now uh, problem that has been developing slowly but surely. So if you kind of rewind back into the late 90s and you were to do a cross section of companies that were in North America. And also, this isn't just about North America. This is other regions. Uh, Europe is, is also... Um, uh, experience or has experienced this as well, where um, there was uh, many more printed circuit board uh, fabricators regionally, 
uh, more EMS uh, per, uh, re regionally, and kind of that more of that, we'll call it that ecosystem. You hear me talk about this throughout. Um, there were more players, but as we learned that we could, um, you know, get at labor components and, um, you know, some of those kind of aspects to the cost side, uh, outsourcing began in this industry. And so now if we fast forward, you know, 25 years, um, the, the receivers of that technology have learned a tremendous amount and it doesn't matter where it is. Um, you know, uh, as an engineer, I'm a firm believer, you know, there's a couple key terms that I like to use, uh, manufacturing matters. If you don't build it, you, 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 will, you will have gains originally in profit and other things by saying, I don't have to build it, I don't have to deal with this overhead, but eventually you won't know how to make it anymore. And right. so you, will, you don't realize you're losing that, that, that capability. So that's really been the genesis of um, across several sectors. Up and you know, for this audience, I'll kind of focus on the PCB and the EMS industry that happened uh, together. And so we find ourselves in this, you know, COVID was a good example where if, if there's any ripple in supply chain um, and you don't have the ability to, to build or, you know, at least second source protect what you're trying to build, uh, that's when people get really nervous. Yeah. I, I think manufacturing is much like languages. There, there are some languages that have died uh, throughout history. And if you stop speaking it and you stop teaching your children that language, it dies and never comes back. And I think manufacturing is, is the same way. Um, yeah, there's a really up, um, famous, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a really, uh, I don't know if famous isn't the right word, but there's a, there's a very important uh, Harvard business uh, review article, HBR article that I always cite and it's dated 2009 mm -hmm. and it's called restoring American competitiveness. And if you, if you read that right now today, you can change out some of the examples of, of the electronic. I think it was a Kindle that they used in the article, but you can read it and just realize how important it is today. And they talk about things, there's a, there's a term called the commons. Um, and so you need front end um, uh, type of technologies with PhD level uh, kind of type of work, you know, pre peer research all the way down to having the facility there, uh, having uh, technicians do it, um, shipping crews, warehouse crews. I mean, it takes that village, right, to make to make the element. And sure. it's, it's, it's amazing how telling it is today. Yeah. And that's really the, the, the root of this is the, the 20 year, to answer your question, the, the, the root of, of this 20 year decay is now upon us. Yeah, uh, the fact that that article was written 13 years ago and still applies 100% today it just tells us what we learn from history is we don't learn from history. Uh, in your estimate, in your uh, best estimate, what's North America's share of the advanced packaging semiconductor chip market? Well, there's a few different ways to look at it. Um, if we look at it from a semiconductor, there's, there's three that I'll cite. So if we look at it from a semiconductor design aspect, uh, North America uh, still holds about 85%, 8.5 of that global share. It means we design a lot of really good things uh, in, in here, here in uh, domestically with about 5% um, kind of in, um, in other regions. I know that doesn't make up 90, but, but there's or 100, but that, that's roughly what the, the share is. Um, in terms of manufacturing, uh, that same, uh, that same, um, uh, advanced package, it's only about 12% in the U S versus 75 in, in, um, in Asia. And then in terms of packaging right now, today, we estimate about 3% with 97%, uh, being done elsewhere. So you, you have to look at it from a design, a manufacturing and a final packaging uh, element, I think, to really get the full picture. Right. And all those numbers aren't very good. It sounds like North America is somewhat the king of design. We just don't want to build it. Let, let someone else do it. But we, in fact, that seems to be the, the, the mantra, right? Yeah, it's it basically what, what this says is that we're, we can design the, the most state-of-the-art systems uh, in the world, but we can't build it. Yeah, and that puts us at a strategic uh, and uh, 
all sorts of liabilities uh, from an economic standpoint. Um, the design is great if you can get it built, and now we rely on other factors, other countries, other people uh, to build it. And from a even national security standpoint, I think that's a little scary to think that like rare earth minerals, you know, uh, that are used in every guidance system and every cell phone and communications technology that we have. Um, we we closed our last uh, rare earth mineral mine years ago because we could find other people willing to get their hands dirty. We didn't have to do it. It was cheaper. Uh, and now we rely on people we are not at war with, but we are at a cold war with um, for our own strategic strength and, and economic strength. And that's, to me, that's incredibly frightening. Um, and it just, I shake my head how we get here. And the way you described how we got here, it's, it makes a lot of sense, but it's, uh, it's still surprising. So, and this is true, Mike, I just wanted to highlight too. I mean, IPC is an international uh, trade association. And uh, one thing while the report and a lot of the work that we were doing was North American based, uh, once we were, published that report, we were, we were hearing very similar things um, with our European members and, and companies there where um, while they had strengths in certain areas, there were, there was still a lot of these same messages uh, and, and um, you know, recommendations that would be, would be uh, applicable to, to them. So it's, I want to kind of talk about this in terms of regional um, where it, it's happened. Several regions are experiencing this. Yeah. It's a, probably almost, <laughs> It would be just as applicable to rename the report um, Western rather than North American because I think just to define it as Western, I think we share a lot of the same concerns, you know, slightly tweaked uh, in, in certain categories, but it still is a major concern. The, the folks yeah. in Germany and, and throughout Europe are outsourcing, you know, every bit as much as we are, maybe not quite as much, but a lot uh, more maybe than they should to avoid what we're seeing today. Um, this kind of just came in um, between the time we, we talked about having this conversation and today, and that is the uh, Chips for America Act or the Chips Act. Uh, part of that was was assigned, uh, was approved, and, and I'm not uh, caught up yet to know was that just a uh, a House approval and it has to go to the Senate, or is that ready to for the president to sign into law? This will be signed by President Biden next week. Okay, so it, it cleared, and. My understanding is that's about a twenty billion dollar federal investment um, deal. Is that is that about right? No, fifty two oh. billion. Even better, fifty two billion. A and where is that money going? Uh, it, it, is that going to build foundries in the U.S.? Is that going to uh, be split up into a, a number of different categories? What's your what's your take on that? Yeah, and that's that's what uh, the the focus uh, the change in focus has been. I mean, if you look, if you kind of back up, a lot of this has been happening very quickly. Um, so even with with less than a year ago, you had um, companies, uh, North American companies, advocating that this is needed, and it was really you know explaining you know the importance of this and what. Uh, what was needed, what was lacking, what the gaps were. And so with the signing of this, um, what it really now will turn into is it'll switch over into implementation, just exactly what your question is. And so there are uh, individual, all individual companies are, are, are looking to um, see how they can participate in this funding uh, with, you know, just company to company type of uh, approaches. But there's also been some industry uh, coalitions that have formed of which uh, IPC is part of two of them. I can mention ASIC. It's the American uh, Semiconductor uh, uh, Coalition uh, led by uh, New York Creates and IBM. And then there's the other one that we are part of. It's uh, MITRE Ingenuity and uh, based out of Washington. Uh, again, uh, not calling them, uh, you know, they're not competing. It's just there's, there's been different groups that are kind of trying to do similar things. And so there's a, a coalition-based approach to this as well. And um, what is interesting, I will say, is um, if you look at what's happened, um, uh, I do say this with a bit of bated smile coming from industry, is that we've, we've actually received money first with the plan second. 
And that's usually a little backwards. Usually you need to go in with a plan to get the money, right? So sure. that, that is being worked out right now. It obviously with, with so much money and, and kind of needs and, and positions, it's, it's, it's very difficult, but I'm very hopeful. I think just the signing of this uh, is a very good sign. Um, you mentioned earlier, everything is important for reliability. There's another thing that, that always has rooted me and that is everything follows silicon, everything. Right. And so with this, you know, however this unfolds, there's going to be winners and losers and people that are happy and unhappy, but it, uh, eventually, you know, just that injection of $52 billion here, uh, will be a catalyst to do lots of different things. This will ripple into substrates and OSAT and even PCB and EMS industries at some point because these these advanced packages are changing dramatically. And you know, if we can talk a little bit about that, I think it would be good in terms of the architectures and what's cut what's coming because it's um it's a very big change. So we already struggle to build, in some cases we just don't build uh, current designed packaging. Uh, it seems to me with the proliferation of just simple things like bottom terminated components, you know, starting with BGA several years ago and to uh, flip chips and things like that. Um, we're not building those, those, those parts for the most part uh, here. I can only imagine based on the speed of technology and the speed of advancement and the, the constant revolving door in terms of product design, um, if we can't build what we're using today, how can we build what we're going to be using tomorrow? Uh, yeah. Will we just skip what we have today and just start concentrating, take that 52 billion and start putting it toward tomorrow's technology? Or are we going to have to spend half of that to just catch up to build, you know, build resistors and capacitors and in, in, you know, simple things or, you know, where do we, where do we say, okay, we're going to start here, you know, or, or do we, just try and be everything to everybody or do we just say okay we've lost that we're fine with that we're just going to build the next gen uh, architecture yeah it's such a great question mike um uh just to put it into context uh if you look at uh the kind of the the top five osat houses uh in the world and you ask them how many different advanced package uh schemes do they support uh, they will say a thousand. Think about a thousand different combinations that mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. Advanced packaging, right? So it's, it's very broad. So, you, so that in itself, you need to, to your question, determine, you know, what needs to move, what can move, um, all of these types of things, right? So you have to be very selective in what we're talking about. Um, and that really comes from the systems and the application that you need to build um, dom domestically, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, um, the easy one that everyone will cite will be, well, you know, we need to have um, certain infrastructure that's available that we could build and design here uh, or, you know, in any region locally, right? And so you may be willing to pay some extra premium to have it built domestically, but you know you're doing it so that you can have continuity of supply and, and those types of things, right? So um, the markets that uh, we definitely see, I mean, the obvious one is defense. Any regional area wants to make sure they can support their defense uh, market. Um, but we also know that a, a defense only um, uh, demand is actually, believe it or not, not large enough. Um, it, it doesn't have enough volume and, um, you know, it's just not economically viable for, you know, the, the, the supply chain companies to sure. only do that. Right. So, um, defense, uh, uh, plus high performance computing is definitely on, on the list, uh, automotive, uh, you know, EV type of applications and medical, those would be, you know, as well as base utility infrastructure type of, of markets. If you were to start to think about the products that are in those segments and say, yes, you need to build them domestically then you can start to continue to unlayer and say, well, what type of technologies are needed for those? And so that's kind of the approach. I realize it's like a top down uh, view, but um, just to basically say, you know, these are the types of technologies we need to build. It's actually looking at it the wrong way. You have to, you have to kind of have it from the application and the demonstrator point of view. 
so that you can define, you know, what's going to actually make it happen. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes sense. Yeah, no, it, yeah it makes total sense. Um, sounds logical. You state in your article that there is almost no uh, capability in the United States to produce uh, the most advanced IC substrates called flip chip ball grid arrays. Um, the U.S. also has a very limited uh, capability and capacity to produce lower end wire bonded substrates. Um, you further state that the U.S. has a 20 plus year market leader uh, know how gap, uh, a weak sub tier supply, uh, skilled work uh, workforce shortage, and a lack of raw materials. Um, what would it take? I agree with all that, by the way. That, that seems very evident. What would it take for the U.S. to remedy this? We talked about how we got here. How do we get, how do we get out of here? Yeah, so there's a near term and a long term. So the near term is, is, is some, let's use IC substrates, for example. Uh, this is not a bring it back to the region story for IC substrates. This is basically uh, obtain that capability for the first time. Now, there are niche applications and capabilities uh, in the country that, that can produce limited volume and, and kind of prototype uh, levels of IC substrates here, but it is um, nowhere near, uh, you know, volume production uh, level. So um, in the near term, uh, printed circuit board companies uh, that might be dealing with HDI type of technologies um, might find it interesting to extend into IC substrates. Now there's a, a fairly big gap there in terms of, as you mentioned, workforce training and, and also all the know-how and, and things, but there is a, <clears throat> potentially a pathway there where existing companies can get into a higher level technology uh, domestically. Um, in terms of the assembly side of things, uh, this is where EMS production uh, that would be building more system level boards uh, might be able to enter into uh, production of uh, components um, you know, in their assembly facilities. Now you're gonna need things like clean rooms and some, you know, this doesn't come out without a price tag, but um, it is doable equipment sets in some cases are similar. They still use pick and place. They still use reflow ovens to, to do a lot of this stuff. There's a lot of thermal uh, interface materials. So it's, it's again, that, that, that similarity between those worlds. So those are two ways, examples that I would give where uh, companies can actually try and get into the market. Uh, because this in, in many cases will be having companies do something they haven't done before. Sure. Including IPC. I mean, we are, we are getting into this uh, advanced packaging space uh, and it means we're dealing with new companies we haven't dealt with before. And, um, you know, I think that's just kind of a sign that, that there is a, a slightly different um, technology area that, that, it, that there's a lot of opportunity here. You know, IPC has several pillars, uh, one of them being education, one being advocacy, one being standards. Uh, I would think advocacy, I think that leg is probably disproportionately more muscular than the other legs uh, that IPC stands on recently, just because of recent times, through COVID, through recessions, through um, uh, trade wars, um, all the tariffs that, that happened, you know, last administration uh, that still haven't been cleared up for the most part. I would imagine the advocacy group is going, hey, we need a vacation, guys. <laughs> We're working overtime. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's also a sign of the path that we're on. I mean, a lot of this, as I mentioned earlier, was just being the voice of industry. It's exactly the, the intent of IPC is to say, um, you know, speak in a louder voice as opposed to siloed companies only um, and say, these are the things that are needed. Um, and, uh, you know, letting people realize the risks if, if you know, of where we are today and, and just calling it out. And I think this, you know, this report, for example, um, has been on the desk of the Department of Commerce, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, uh, NIST. Um, so we are very tightly uh, integrated with, you know, some of that decision making. It's hard to tell how much influence, you know, our effort had on as a singular uh, effort. But, you know, a lot of groups have been doing this. And I think that's why you've seen the CHIPS Act uh, you know, people really pay attention because there were so m many 
groups and companies saying we, we can't we can't not do this. Right. I don't think the general public cared a whole lot about the chip shortage until they couldn't get their favorite feature in their in their Ford or their GM car. All of a sudden, everyone cares about the chip shortage now, right? Because uh, it, it made it harder to buy certain features in certain cars. Uh, would adding domestic semiconductor fabs, uh, fabrication foundries uh, without domestic IC substrate supply and OSAT assemblies uh, lengthen or shorten the uh, supply chain, in your opinion? Lengthen, absolutely lengthen. And that's the key message. Uh, you know, we talk about advocacy. Um, while, you know, we applaud the the amount of uh, effort and focus and the need uh, that needs to occur within the semiconductor industry, the, the raw silicon, that's what's really making these changes for advanced processing for artificial intelligence, uh, for all kinds of new applications. Um, the, the reality is, is that it's just one part of a, of a larger ecosystem. So, um, Fabs, you know, one fab, by the way, just in terms of round numbers. So you, you can think of the, uh, there's, you know, semi, uh, uh, Samsung, TSMC, Intel, all have bulldozers running right now. The site uh, are, are well, you know, well on their way. $20 billion for one fab. That's to build it. $5 billion maintenance, roughly, uh, to keep it going at the latest node. I mean, these numbers are astronomical, right? Right. And it's not built in a week either. I mean, it takes a significant time to. Three build years. It. Three years. So even um, if every country in the world dedicated billions, trillions of dollars toward building 20 new fab foundries, we're not going to see anything for at least a few years uh, before. Well, actually, the gate from us, I'll give you one example in terms of substrate. So even if you said, OK, I want I'm, I'm all in. I want to get into this market. You'll be on a two year waiting list for fab equipment. Right. Right. So we're talking about um, several years before we see the first chip roll off the assembly line. Uh, no, well, it's coming fast, uh, 2023, 2024. So but people are already ahead, right? Remember when, right. when when the public hears this, it's already in motion. Right, right. We are um, we are addressing it. It's just in it's in play right now. Right. So uh, what, you know, to get back to your question, um, semiconductor, absolutely important. Everything follows silicon. But you don't hold a piece of silicon in your hand to talk to me or to, to communicate with me over this uh, podcast. It's packaged in a component put into a system that become you know, you hold a phone in your hand, right? So um, it really depends on where you draw the line. So there's silicon. That silicon basically goes on to a substrate of some sort. And that substrate um, is built by an OSAT producer or some other assembly test house to put it all together. And it's not until that point where it becomes a finished part number that you can buy, that you can put on your board that becomes a system. Right. And so it's, it's, you know, having, uh, semiconductor fabs and foundries only will just create bottlenecks elsewhere in the supply chain. So that's why we cannot forget about these other legs of, of the production uh, cycle. Sure. You reference OSAP producer in your answer, um, on that subject, there's just one U.S. based, U.S. headquartered OSAP producer in the uh, top 20 uh, globally. It's second overall. And while this company is headquartered in the United States, it does not have assembly plants anywhere in North America. Uh, what would it take to convince, say, that company or any company for that matter in the same situation um, to, to reshore assembly plants back in? I don't want to just say United States, but North America, since we're talking about North America, or the West, if we want to make it a larger region that's experiencing the same issue. What would it take to talk to, to convince that company or any other in that situation to um, bring it back? Bring it back. It's time to come back home. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the, the simplest answer is um, it has to be a sustainable business model. And that's, that's really the problem is that, um, um, even with, we, we have to be careful about getting too excited with these subsidies, uh, because, uh, while there'll be a lot of things that happen with the subsidy money, and we can even put it against a few years or several years, um, it will be a subsidized and kind of artificially propped up, uh, condition. And so unless that subsidy continues, uh, you'll have to have a successful business model to last 
uh, you know, the longer term. And that's what's really the sticking point for, you know, kind of the, the, the case you gave here from the OSAC company where you can lure somebody, I guess, if I can use that term with some money, but you have to show that demand in the market you know, lasting five, you know, beyond five years, that's the last 10 years, 15 years. I mean, sure. again, with all that infrastructure installation, you know, this has to be a sustainable business model. So it's as simple as that. Yeah. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Scotland because that's where my family's from, that's where my wife is from. And um, I remember there was a, a particular town in Scotland that attracted a bunch of tech companies, Tandy, back in the day when Tandy was a company, was there and other, other computer manufacturers were there. But they were there for the subsidies. And probably I'm not far off by saying literally to the day, those subsidies expired, they're gone. They were gone. And now there's all these you know, empty factory buildings, or there was empty factory buildings for a long time, because they were there for the subsidies. And it, to your point, Matt, the, the CHIPS Act, the investment in federal dollars, is like starter fluid on a carburetor. It'll get the car started, but it's not designed to be run on it. And uh, there are countries in the world where, you know, they, they're designed to run on subsidies. That's just the way the government works. Uh, we're not one of those. And it's very rare for the U.S. to subsidize business, private business. Uh, it, it doesn't happen very often. It has happened over time. It hasn't always been successful. Um, but I, I think to get us out of this situation, there are certain things that are just too big for civilian companies uh, to, to deal with. And it, it takes the full credit and financial resources of a, of a federal government to remedy the past 25 years worth of, in hindsight, mistakes that, that our industry made. Probably weren't mistakes in real time. They probably made sense in real time, but in, in totality, cumulatively, they became one big mistake. So IPC published, uh, the whole reason we're talking is IPC published a, uh, a a, a paper, uh, so to speak, uh, with 28 recommendations to rebuild the U.S. advanced, advanced packaging ecosystem and reinforce the effort to expand domestic semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, can you walk me through, we don't have time to go through all 28 steps, and, and, and maybe it's down to 27 because we just got $52 billion. So maybe that was one of those steps. But um, uh, what were some of the, the notable uh, recommendations uh, that IPC made that um, – the U.S. or North America or the West in general can uh, adopt to help remedy this situation. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just kind of walk through a, a few of them here. But uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, manufacturing matters. I think that's absolutely our number one recommendation. Uh, the manufacturing and that ecosystem approach as, as we move forward now uh, through this next period in time that that we need to make sure that that we understand this concept from uh, you know, thinking about new technologies at the design side, but then getting all the way through and figuring out how it's going to be manufactured as well as, uh, you know, things like sustainability, like how can we um, recycle it or reuse it or modularly design it? I mean, all of these, there's lots of topics in here, but um, you can't do any of that if you're not manufacturing it. And so I am not naive in the sense that the global supply chain is, is is alive and strong, and it will absolutely continue. But the way that I the way that I think about it is kind of like um, at your, um, especially in the summertime here uh, in Toronto, uh, there's the, this campaign of buy local, right? So you local berries and, and vegetables and things, and support your local farms. Um, it's the same thing. Is it's it's like a, a regional plus global supply chain point of view, not just global supply chain at all costs so I can get an extra point or two on my margin. Uh, I'm being a bit exaggerated, I'm exaggerating a bit, but um, I think that's, you know, far and above the, the biggest recommendation uh, that, uh, you know, we really got to make sure that we, we manufacture, it has a lot of implement, uh, implications, like, you know, you build those facilities, you don't want them to be empty, you need people in them, and, but you need the demand to make it economically viable. So it's, it's, it's a very complicated um, endeavor, but that's, we need to be, you know, manufacturing has to be a little bit more exciting and, and put on the top of people's lists. Yeah, makes the other sense. recommendation is um, what I would call silicon to systems. And I've mentioned this before that um, everything follows silicon. Um, 
with these changes in uh, heterogeneous integration and chiplet architectures, make no mistake, uh, this will show up in the printed circuit board industry and in EMS uh, eventually um, with a whole bunch of challenges. Companies in these spaces just may not see it yet. So uh, I would recommend that everybody really pay attention to what's happening uh, technically in the, uh, the semiconductor world and the packaging world because this will fuel the next 10 years plus of growth in our industry. Yeah, excellent. Um, and then, you know, there's a whole bunch in here. I'm, I'm just kind of looking through my list here. Um, I, I should mention um, the concept of, of heterogeneous uh, integration and chiplets. So um, if these are new terms to, to you, I would recommend uh, spending some time looking them up. But, but basically, we started the conversation with Moore's Law. And, you know, for a fact, it, you know, Moore's Law is essentially dead. Um, and so if we're going to continue at this rate of pace with functionality and, and speed and, and all these things, uh, we have to find new design methods. And what chiplets are in heterogeneous integration is, is, is combining chips together. It's like multi-chip modules back in the day so that you can get memory and compute and all these things you're trying to get the package to do uh, all within the same package. So you'll see stacked uh, memory, for example, uh, all kinds of different configurations. So um, <clears throat> the recommendation I would give is is really spend more time in the heterogeneous integration and chiplet area. Uh, it, some of it gets quite complicated, but at least be familiar with what this technology is driving. Sure. We're going to have to wrap up soon, but I, there are a couple of questions I, I do want to ask you. Number one, we're all in this industry. Um, we're all stakeholders in this industry. We all have something to gain or something to lose uh, for how our industry, how this all plays out in our industry. What can we do as, as stakeholders in this industry to help support the efforts, either IPC's efforts or other efforts uh, that will help turn around North American, Western in general manufacturing? What, what can we do? What, what can I do as a business owner in our industry or anyone else do for that matter to uh, support this, this type of effort? Well, I think the, the very first thing, again, in terms, and I love the question, Mike, because it's, you know, we've talked a lot of philosophy and kind of status of what's happening, but like, what can I do in terms of call to action? Um, I think the number one thing is really just get educated. Uh, you talked about advocacy and how, you know, we, we were uh, uh, tired on, on that side with, with everything we've been doing. Uh, but um, it's very, it's very true. If, if you're not familiar with uh, what is really happening. A lot of people will nod their head. You know, I know what advanced packages, I know what a uh, semiconductor is, but there is more going on right now than ever before in this industry that I've seen in my 20 years. And so um, really read up on those types of chip architectures and, and what's happening because those developments will spin off into materials needs, uh, qualification needs, reliability needs, uh, assembly challenges, all the things, uh, you know, that would, that will come from this. And cause if you don't understand the base technology, um, then, you know, you really can't, you know, offer up new material sets or new cleaning methods or new assembly processes, those kinds of things. Sure. And before we say goodbye, um, I want to uh, ask you about a symposium that IPC is, uh, is announcing right now on this show. Uh, you heard it here first. Uh, tell me about that symposium. Where is it? What is it? When is it? What is it all about? Who should go? Yeah, we're really excited. Um, this will be IPC's first uh, advanced packaging symposium entitled Building the IC Substrate and Package Assembly Ecosystem. It'll be held October 11th and 12th. It'll be held in Washington, D.C. this fall and held at the Kimpton Hotel Monaco. So we're, we're really excited that we're able to uh, get the right people together. Uh, what's really interesting is that the, the lineup of, of speakers are, it's, it, it's very deliberate, the agenda. It's been fully curated and um, it has a top-down agenda where we're going to talk about updates from groups like the Department of Commerce and Defense on what, what is needed at the high level, but then walk all the way through from component OEMs, uh, uh, IC substrate manufacturers, 
uh, PCB suppliers and then keep going down into material suppliers. So we have a really good group. Uh, I've got, I can name a few. We've got AMD, Amcor, ATS, Veritech, Calumet, uh, IBM Research, NIST, uh, wow. Schweitzer. So we've got a, we've got a very good you got list. The, you got the A team showing up. Yeah. And it, it was, you know, just, it's just extremely timely again with that chip spill being signed next week. Uh, the focus is turning to implementation. And so that's what the, that's what the symposium will be all about is, um, is about converting those, those challenges, but, you know, into, you know, what, what companies can actually do about it. So this, is this a symposium designed to be attended by manufacturers of advanced packaging um, uh, product, or is it? Uh, is there any end user um, participation or 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 interest? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got a cross section of the component and device makers like AMD, Intel, IBM. We've got uh, system users like Northrop Grumman. Uh, we've got uh, IC substrate producers like Semco. Uh, ATS and new entrants like a Veritech and Calumet. So, um, yeah, it, it's really trying to touch the, the the different spots in that supply chain, and then also talking technically and business wise, you know, through the two days. It's a it's a two day event. Interesting. Okay, last last question. Uh, oh, first of all, if, for my audience, if you're listening, look at the show notes on your podcast app. I'll have information on that conference uh, and information on. Um, the, the uh, IPC uh, article, the recommendation article that we've been talking about, all listed there. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, look down where it says show more. Click on that and you'll, you'll get links to the uh, symposium, the conference, and the, the uh, article that we're talking about. Matt, um, final parting question. Get your crystal ball out and uh, look into it deeply. Where do you see North American manufacturing uh, in the next 10 years? Next 10 years. Um, I think we're going to continue our strong design capability. I do think that we will continue to have this economic challenge of, you know, what we really can build here in volume. But, um, as we've talked about in other shows as well, um, the, these concepts of factory, the future and automation, these are ways that companies can actually become more competitively, uh, uh, viable for the long term and sustainable. So what I would what I would hope for would be, uh, you know, companies in North America now, while not, you know, explosive, but, uh, you know, a, a good, a, a, a fair number of, of, of good cases where we are actually producing, you know, these key components, like we talked about through your show, um, and being healthy companies. Um, kind of in a lower volume, high mix scenario that is highly automated, that is efficient with low scrap. I, I know now I'm starting to rattle off everybody's wish list, but, um, you know, pointed in that direction. I, I think these factory of the future concepts are, it's directionally correct. The adoption is still slow because of capital requirements, but I would like to see the adoption of some, some more advanced process techniques and, and use of data to, to make North America more competitive, you know, in, in the advanced packaging space along with that, you know, I, you know, there, there still will be a strong global supply chain component to this. I mean, I, the example I give are our capacitors and resistors, you know, we are not moving a world-class resistor factory from Southeast Asia to North America as a completely different example, right? I mean, the global supply chain will be needed, but I hope that there's a little bit more of a balance on, on what can be built uh, so that, you know, there is more resiliency and sustainability built into the supply chain. Sure. I think um, what we really need to do is, is bring back th this, put it on everyone's desk as we started the show with, we need to think about the uh, future of North American manufacturing. We were at a time in our past, not too distant past, uh, we were the manufacturing, the manufacturers of the world, the West, I, I say. And um, we gave that up and we were content being the designers of the world. That is not our trophy forever. That trophy can change hands very easily. 
uh, if we lose that, then we are simply going to be at the mercy of every country that wants to influence us, and uh, for good or for or, or not. Uh, I, I think now is the time to wrestle that trophy back. And you know, we don't have to be the best and the biggest, but I think we need some form of independent capacity um, for strategic reasons, if not economic reasons, but for a host of reasons, beginning with strategic. Uh, and, and it's so expensive to claw that back, that $52 billion that the federal government's, you know, think about it, that's enough for two foundries <laughs> and a little bit of change. Um, and so that is a small number, in, in a very, very impressive number, but it's relatively speaking a small number. We need so much more. And I think we need a mindset change first because we have to really, 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 really want it and, and get a sense that we need to do this uh, for so many different reasons uh, and, and then just start clawing it back. We built it once. We can build it again. It's more expensive to build it now than it was before, but we can do it. And the longer we wait, the more in the hole we'll be. And, and then there'll come a point where we won't be able to do it. And I don't think we're at that point yet. But uh, I, I appreciate the work that IPC is doing uh, in the advocacy side. Uh, they're certainly not getting any extra vacation time right now. And I appreciate the work you're doing with, uh, with this article and those recommendations for um, North America to, to adopt. I think they're wise. I think they, they make a lot of sense. Uh, and I think it's still an uphill battle. Uh, so uh, uh, keep, keep um, uh, going after hearts and minds and funds. And um, hopefully we can, we can turn this around and, and we can be a little bit more independent. Uh, still working with partners globally. This is a global, you know, we're all connected. This is a very small planet we're on and we are all connected and we all have a part to play. Um, but we all need to be able to play multiple parts. We can't just be like an orchestra. We can't have one drummer, one strings, you know, one brass. We need to, um, because that, that works when everyone is participating. But if all of a sudden the drummer wants to, go off and only drum for his own group, you know, that now, now the orchestra's in trouble. And I think that's kind of where we are now. So we really need um, to have a redundancy of talent, a redundancy of capabilities, um, so that no one country is relying on the rest of the world, on the rest of the orchestra to make music. Uh, we need to make music independently. Uh, and I appreciate the work that uh, your team is doing and others. Uh, and um, uh, again, uh, for my audience, uh, look at the show notes. Uh, if you're on YouTube, click uh, show more. I'll give links to um, the information uh, from IPC and how uh, you can contact them and, and get involved. And uh, I'll have uh, links to the conference as well. So Matt, thank you so much for once again being my guest on the show. Uh, you're always uh, a joy to talk to and, and a plethora of information. I, I really appreciate the work you do and uh, the time that you've carved out to uh, talk to me and my audience. Thank you, Mike. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to or watching the Reliability Matters podcast. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on our newest channel, Amazon Music, or virtually wherever you get your podcasts. A special thanks to Circuit Assembly Magazine's PCB Chat at pcbchat.com and Ascendo Reliability at reliability.fm for syndicating the show. Thanks for all of your questions and episode suggestions. Please keep them coming. You can send comments and episode suggestions to my email, mike at mikeconrad.com. Just remember that's Conrad with a K. And be sure and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. Or if you're watching this podcast on YouTube, on the Reliability Matters YouTube channel, click on the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified when new episodes are released. We release new episodes on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. Once again, thanks for listening or watching. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and perhaps most importantly, keep doing it right. I'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.